Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, University of Toronto. And uh, it's wonderful Center for Jewish Studies and Slavic Department. I'm honored and very happy to finally be here. Uh, by which I mean that arriving here took some um, effort uh, on the part of heavens. They were misbehaving, then behaving, and here I am to talk to you. Um, it's been a part of my life. Uh, I feel incredibly privileged uh, to talk about writers, about whom I'll be talking uh, today again. Gennady Gor is one of them. And actually, it's rather convenient uh, that Anna uh, decided <laughs> to mention uh, this anthology because this is precisely what I'll be talking about and sharing uh, my research and my relationship with this um, realm, with this world of poetry. Um, also, I wanted, um, I would like to uh, mention that usually there is this uh, world of niceties that one observes uh, during the talks. Uh, somebody in introduces, somebody thanks, uh, lots of time is wasted. Uh, but I would like to say that without Professor Sternzis, maybe this direction uh, of my thinking would never happen. Uh, it's not an um, intellectually, it's not an easy one, it's not a transparent one. Uh, but I would say a very curious one. Uh, at some point, uh, when we were talking about these writers, about these poets, Anna just asked me, look, most of them are Jewish. Uh, what did it mean to be a Jew in the siege of Leningrad? Um, so I got kind of stuck with this question, and I'm still not unstuck. Um, I'm still living with it. I will be reading uh, my remarks, then I will be interrupting myself as it happens, right? Then I will be forgetting where I am and smiling with you. Uh, the present version of this talk is called In the Cold Cities. Poetics of Self and Memory in the Siege Traumatic Texts by Gennady Gor. My presentation examines the idea of construed Jewishness as continuity of poetics in the pre-war prose and the Leningrad siege poetry of Gennady. The original name, his original name was actually Gdali Gor. One of the most striking difficult, and I would go as far as to say mysterious authors produced or maybe revealed by the siege of Leningrad. I would like also to introduce literary and historical context of Gore's poetry, non-official writing that was taking place in the city during its darkest hours. The question of the Jewish author, Could you speak in yes, the question, uh -huh. the question of the Jewish author and the siege is a difficult one. On the one hand, many of the siege creative notables were ethnically Jewish. For example, Lydia Ginsburg, um, who is uh, most known as uh, the only woman amidst the uh, so-called Russian formalist school. She was a student of Shklovsky and Tenyanov. Uh, Vera Inber, Pavel Zaltzman in literature. Solomon Yudovin, Yakov Rubanchik, Anatoly Kaplan in visual art. However, for various reasons, all these authors basically chose to ignore or downplay their origins in their siege work, or in most of their writing in general. 
which would be the case of the siege perhaps most brilliant analyst, Lydia Ginsburg, whom I just mentioned, for whom her ethnicity uh, was perhaps even more problematic, t uh, even more of a taboo subject than her sexuality. Uh, Ginsburg uh, was homosexual. We know about that from her um, archive now. And these both uh, subjects, that she was a Jew and that she was a lesbian, were extremely difficult for her to write about. My question when approaching the task of our meeting here was, were these authors who managed to find a place for their Jewish identity contemplation in, the, uh, in their siege creative output, were they people who wrote about the siege from the Jewish standpoint? How can we think about different ways to connect these two topics, Jewishness and the siege? So one author, who after all came to my mind, was Gore, perhaps the most unofficial of all the siege writers. Uh, Gore didn't publish one word of his siege poetry during his lifetime, creating a situation of radically negative intended readership. Consequently, the fact that one finds residual traces of Jewish identity self-writing in Gore's work of all the siege writers allows us to suggest that contemplating Jewishness during the siege was not a topic sought by those in ideological power. It was delegated to the non-publishable realm of creative work. There are several scholars today who study Jewish question during the siege. Their findings mostly concern predictable rise and unfortunate rise of anti-Semitism in the troubled city. Um, I would like to mention now two of uh, the perhaps most remarkable siege diaries. Uh, one of them is published, was widely discussed. It's a diary by Lubov Shaporina. Uh, it was published by New Literary Observer several years ago. Uh, Shaporina uh, suffered a lot during the Stalinist purges and she saved uh, children of her friend. Uh, the friend was arrested, risking her life. Shapurina took the children in. She herself was uh, an art historian and a wife of famous composer. Uh, one of the most problematic, kind of unbearable uh, things about this diary that uh, with every month, with every week of the siege, it grows more and more flagrantly anti-Semitic. It's a very useful document to study anti-Semitism uh, during the siege. And sometimes uh, it, it became um, famous, or rather infamous, uh, among the Russian readers, uh, Russian language readers, rather often when people ask me, so what do you think about Shapur in a diary, or what can you suggest as an anti-text? Um, I say that there is uh, a diary that is still awaiting its publication. Uh, and for me, it's a point of certain excitement. It's a diary of uh, the cousin of Boris Pasternak, the diary of Olga Freidenberg, uh, maybe one of the most brilliant uh, scholars of antiquity uh, who lived in Soviet Union at this point. Um, another very problematic diary uh, that Freidenberg, who herself was a Jew, writes a lot about Jews, Jewish behavior, Jewish choices, Jewish topics during the siege. She is remarkably open-minded about it, I think. Uh, and she, as a result, uh, 
she asks uh, many times, um, now the diary, by the way, uh, speaking of miraculous fates of all these documents that I will be mentioning all the time, the diary is in Stanford, California. Uh, Russian, Soviet, uh, Jewish documents travel miraculously. So, uh, as a result, Friedenberg, who is merciless, mercilessly honest, uh, comes up, I think, as a more passionate Udephile in the result of her writing. Um, and again, since we are promised some time for Q&A, I'm happy to talk about these documents. They are on the margins of this conversation. So, but what about um, creative writing? What about uh, fiction? What about poetry? What do we find there uh, about Jewish faith during the siege? As I said, not much. Actually, for some time I thought nothing uh, with certain unease. And then and uh, reading and rereading and translating and publishing Gore, I, I began looking at uh, through a diff somewhat different lens. And this is uh, what I have to offer to my attention, your attention, to our scrutiny. Uh, Gore, his biography. Uh, his biography is remarkable. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, one thinks that um, even biographies of writers should be written up, should be imagined. Like a good writer should have a good biography. Uh, Gore does have a good biography. For example, he was born in prison. Uh, this is how it all started. Uh, his parents, very young, uh, were uh, in revolution. Uh, he was born in Chita, and as a result uh, of this remarkable um, <laughs> misfortune, he spent his childhood in Baikal region, in and around the legendary town of Barguzin, uh, with his relatives. And uh, his childhood was very much focused on uh, his um, going to Jewish school, reading Jewish books, and being in relationship to his many, many Jewish yes, thank you uh, relatives. At the ripe age of 20, Gore arrives to, it was for a couple of years, Petrograd, but then Leningrad, right? Um, the city with more names than any city we can think of. Uh, he is a literary character. He wants to write. Uh, when you arrive to uh, Leningrad, you want to write. Uh, and he rather fast. He begins publishing uh, and he becomes a figure of notice in literary circles of the city. Uh, being in Leningrad at the end of the 1920s was kind of maybe one of the best moments uh, to start a literary career of the 20th century. Um, we do know like the best time was from 19, I would say 27 to 1934. And uh, in 1934, uh, the city's uh, party leader and um, ideological leader, and I would say intellectual leader to some extent, Sergei Kirov, was murdered, and most of the people who attempted their freedom in the city couldn't do it any longer. But until that moment, this is me, um, coloring this story very, very short. There were many journals, uh, many circles, many literary schools, many, many ways uh, to try writing. Um, and uh, Gore, I would say, found uh, some of the most interesting people in the city. I will repeat this abbreviation many times. So. Um, maybe um, it's good to start 
developing your ear towards it. He found the strangest people in the city, the funniest, uh, the most trying ones. They called themselves Abariu, the union for the real art. Um, why um, they called themselves the union of, or the union of, for the real art, it's a huge question. Um, there are many, many explanation, explanations for this. Um, sometimes one thinks uh, to provoke. I, I would say that 90% of what they were doing was to provoke. Uh, sometimes also uh, in an effort to um, re-establish their relationship with aesthetic reality. Gennady Gore meets these poets, meets these writers, and becomes close to the leader of the circle, Daniel Harms. So uh, for the people in the room interested in Soviet literature, interested in Leningrad literature, interested in avant-garde literature, or interested in literature for children, Daniel Harms is the brand name. Uh, every uh, child who knows Russian language in this century or for some decades of the last century knows many, many poems of Daniel Harms, the leader of Abriu by Had. And this is also a remarkable story of uh, what was published, what was publishable, and what was unpublishable in that um, situation, in that empire. Harms was tremendously popular as a writer for children. Uh, and he didn't publish one poem, one of his adult poems during his lifetime. Also, as you can maybe imagine, it's not easy to have a last name of Harms. Uh, if you're a Russian poet, it's a pseudonym. It's one of my personal favorite pseudonyms that our culture created. Um, Harms, who was a polyglot, actually his first language, which is curious, was German. Russian was his second language. English was his third language. So his last name is a con combination of to charm and to harm. Um, right, his real name was Yufachov. So kind of this figure of the evil magician who was really, really good with words. Uh, Gore became extremely attracted by what Harms was doing, and rather soon he paid for it dearly. He, uh, Gore writes his first novella called Karova, the cow, and uh, is immediately punished for it. Uh, he is accused of being a formalist writer. Another popular uh, accusation of the moment and actually, it, it does something to Gore that we might discuss at some point. Um, he stops writing for several years uh, and doesn't return to the official world of literature for decades. Uh, and when I say that he is punished, actually what was happening in the mid-30s in the Soviet Union and the Leningrad and the situation, um, the ideological uh, worker, ideologically Rabotnik, would uh, invite uh, writers and publishers and journalists to a, a gathering like this and explain how ideologically um, awful a certain piece of literature was. And then the young writer would uh, come and agree with this accusation and talk for an hour or something uh, about how awful it was what he did. And then, in most cases, things would uh, continue. Uh, but there were exceptions. For example, another remarkable uh, writer of the moment, to whom Gore was very close, Leonid Dabichin, after that very procedure that I just described, disappeared. This is one uh, of, kind of, of many, many uh, inimaginable cases of Soviet literature and Soviet history. This is a rather remarkable case. We now think that Dabichin just uh, killed himself, he drowned himself, but no trace was found. 
of one of the subtlest stylists of the Leningrad literature. So ideological situation in Leningrad was rather sharp, to say the least. So Gord tries to write avant-garde prose, uh, and it doesn't go so well. Um, we all now can read this novella about Kalhos, about uh, difficult fate of a peasant. The text that I bring to your attention, called In a Cold City, в городке студеном, in a, in a town, city town, in a town called Studioney. Uh, went almost unnoticed. It's a memoir about Gore's childhood. It was published in 1934. Uh, not much uh, response emerged at that point. Style of his prose is markedly connected with the emerging Jewish expressionism in the early Soviet writing. I even found an epigram in the newspaper of the day. Uh, please do not take this joke too personally, dear Gennady Gor. Rather than imitating Babel, try to write something of your own. Uh, actually, uh, what is also curious that this epigram belongs to uh, also another young poet called Olga Bergold. Uh, kind of this is foot, a footnote, but an extremely poignant one. Olga Bergold's fate uh, uh, in 10 years was to become the most important official voice of the siege. Uh, and it's incredibly curious to observe how these fates begin moving towards each other and how the future map of their literary activities becomes enacted. In his article about Jewish expressionism in Leningrad avant-garde prose of the 1930s, Valery Dimschitz, one of my personally uh, favorite scholars of this topic, makes argument that there were several young writers in Leningrad at the moment who attempted to connect these two areas of influence. Uh, avant-garde writing and Jewish topic. Dimschitz mentions Berlevin, Pavel Zaltzman, but mostly he writes about Gore. In Gore's oeuvre, the most important utterance, as I just said, happens in this memoir novella. What are the main topics of his text? He constantly creates juxtaposition between the natural world and the urban world, where urban incorporates his perception of things Jewish, tradition, business, education, family connections. Dynamics of relationships between these worlds forms the main crux of, the te of this text's poetics. Yet another crucial component of how Gore depicts his Jewish upbringing in Siberia is violence. Violence is all pervasive here. It erupts suddenly and touches everybody. The only part of this world that is devoid of utterance is nature. I argue that it is precisely this combination of factors the urban, the natural, and the violent in its conversation with his Jewishness that we find collaged in the Gore siege poetry. And basically, this is the argument that I make. Because at the moment when they, and I will go to this they, when they found Gore's poetry, everybody's impression was that there exists this strange thing this corpus, this body of texts, and it doesn't have precedent. Uh, neither in the literature of the moment, nor in Gore's writing. So I'm trying to show that this is not how it happens in literature, that everything is connected to something, and that actually Gore started weaving the strange texture, 
earlier. It's just the, um, for the lack of the better word, intensity of the siege experienced allowed him to connect these dots in the most expressive way possible. Uh, Gore was not the uh, only uh, poet, the only author mesmerized by the world of Daniel Harms, uh, by the world of Abariu. Actually, uh, this anthology offers to your attention, to our attention, to our rereading five authors. Um, their writing is connected to the historical environment in many important ways. And maybe now it is, uh, I will take a moment to remind us about this historical environment. Um, with its death toll of arguably one million victims, uh, which again if invites a footnote, um, and we can talk for hours of actually uh, how many people died during the siege and so on. And usually when asked about it during my courses and during my lectures, uh, I answer that we don't know, we never will know, and there are uh, extremely um, interesting and disturbing reasons. Uh, so this, uh, but at this point in 2018, we say one million. What else do we know? We know that the siege lasted for three years, approximately. And uh, as such, it was one of the most significant military events of its kind in modern history. Uh, another thing that we can uh, pronounce more or less safely, that the siege of Leningrad is one of the most described, wrote, written about events in the 20th century history, and that this fact is nicely connected, combined with the other fact that we know almost nothing about it. Uh, that the research about the siege, the research about the siege culture, the research uh, about siege writing is still at its very beginning. So how these two things um, are possible at the same time? Uh, there, right uh, September 8th, maybe even before the September 8th, which is the official uh, starting date of the siege, huge machine of propaganda began working, huge and beautiful and smart and mesmerizing. Uh, we cannot think about a genre of propaganda uh, that didn't emerge. Um, writing about this event includes novels, uh, includes poetry cycles, includes many, many um, serialized forms. Uh, and of my favorite forms about the siege, I would name things like vaudeville uh, that were produced uh, for uh, various uh, situations in the city. Uh, Lydia Ginsburg, whom I mentioned at the very beginning uh, of this talk, uh, came up with a term that my every editor highlighted as ugly and awkward. Um, this is the term publishable, right? Sounds very Soviet, publikabilnost. Uh, Ginsburg suggested that this notion to write something publishable about the siege, publishable in the Soviet situation or not, this was the first question that every writer in the city uh, would pose, would uh, create for himself or herself. So if you would like to be published, to write something publishable, you would create certain version uh, of the events. Uh, and also, it, it should be mentioned in connection that if you would be able to write something publishable, you would be fed <laughs> in a certain way. Uh, because with being publishable, rations came which kind of uh, adds a new dimension uh, to this conversation, a unique dimension about the whole Soviet institution of literature. 
If, on the other hand, uh, you, you wouldn't, you didn't want, you would choose not to write something in agreement with Soviet propaganda. Uh, you, it also had its pluses and minuses. Uh, for example, um, you could write whatever you wanted. And now I will do precisely what Professor Sterns has mentioned as the most unpleasant part of this talk. I will read to you uh, that very poem by Gore uh, that made him famous, infamous, and I would argue made him the central poet of this historical event. A girl I devoured, the giggler, Rebecca, and the raven looked on at my luncheon horrific. And the raven looked on at me like at boredom. How slowly the human was eating the human. The raven looked on, but in vain. I never did throw him an arm of Rebecca's. Я девушку съел хохотунью Ревеку, и ворон глядел на обед мой ужасный. И ворон глядел на меня, как на скуку, как медленно ел человек человека, и ворон глядел, но напрасно не бросил ему я Ревекину руку. What shocks, surprises us the most in this poem? It might be the detailed description of the siege most famous secret and the most real nightmare. Cannibalism. It might be a fatic slippage of language. Uh, in, in Russian, there is something funny happening with grammar. And this something funny is also one of the strongest things of Gore's writing. He kind of he subverts, he undoes grammar at the sutures. Maybe another thing. Uh, that upsets us is that he mentions his beloved pet poet Edgar Allan Poe, who is mentioned dozens of times in his siege poetry, together with Ovid and Pushkin. Actually, what Gore does, he relocates them in the siege world. Or maybe what is so upsetting is all these things taken all together. How Gore connects them. And another thing that is so important there, that this girl, Rebecca, the laughing girl, she comes directly from his siege memoir about his childhood. She is one of the heroines of that forgotten strange, quasi-idyllic world. I can read you another poem. I will read it only in English, uh, since we, as usual, are short on time. And you will see how all these elements that I mentioned uh, as crucial for his childhood writing, this um, radical difference between the world urban and the world natural, and a uh, constant um, connection, painful connection between the childhood and the violence, how all these elements emerge here. A red drop in snow and a boy with a green face like a cat. Passerby keep treading on his legs, his eyes. They have no time. Signs peeling butter, white bread, beer. As though there were such a thing as white bread. Home, sweet, exposed it all. Doors and windows its own self. And I, I dream of childhood. Grandma with her little hands, geese mountains, a river over stones, the Vitimkan. Vitimkan is the Siberian river. Very important in his prose. In comes mama 
long underground, there is no time. A llama in a yellow gown sits on a chair. He touches a rosary with his hand. And mama is laughing, patting his face. She sits down on his lap. And time keeps stretching, keeps stretching, elongating. I am afraid to be late to the Neva river for water. We find here lots of nature imagery that is central to his memoir, as I mentioned above. We see river, mountains, birds, stones, everything discussed with such caress and attention in his earlier work on his uh, world of Jewish childhood. Gore's direct address to these images, memories, memory images, becomes possible due to his operations on time in these poems. He pronounces time at once non-existent and absolutely porous, flexible. According to these new laws of time, nothing separates any more past from the present. His striking childhood from the siege. The here and now time is cancelled, which allows the other time, time of memory, to flow freely into the present. But what will become of it here in the siege? When his childhood enters the realm of Leningrad 1942 via the memory canal, in order to comfort the subject suffering from the siege, this past becomes endangered as the siege subject himself, as the siege writer himself. The childhood memory, so well shaped and wholesome in the memoir, becomes shattered and aphatically disfigured in poetry. What we see everywhere is just its fragments. Thus, master metaphors of Gore's siege writing, dispersal fragmentation as a result of cannibalism and bombing enter his language work. We mostly face here the shattered remains. And when we see in Gore's siege poetry characters from his Jewish childhood, Gil Rebecca and his friend Aaron, as well as Ginsburg and Rabinovich, who wander around the uh, streets of Leningrad. Strangers mentioned by their last names only. We react to them as to the memory fragments doomed for the work of the siege dispersal. Um, so this is what I suggest, that as in the same way as uh, Gore relocates into his strange kingdom of the siege at Garalan Po and other poets, he relocates his Jewish childhood. And uh, we can call it a form of laboratory uh, because his uh, creative task is to observe what happens to this childhood language as the result of the siege trauma. Uh, I would like to finish this part of conversation uh, by the remark about um, literary history and genesis. As I already mentioned, uh, this poetry was not found until 15 years ago. Uh, it was for these poems, there were 82 of them, were found by Gore's grandchildren. Uh, it sounds like, you know, uh, kind of n not the very best romantic novella. Indeed, they looked into the writer's desk. Indeed, they found a strange notepad. Indeed, they began showing it around. Um, it was already perestroika time. And they received an advice from many of his writer's friends to burn it which is one of my favorite parts of this story. Uh, but they didn't. And at some point, they showed it to a remarkable German scholar 
uh, and translator Peter Urban, who published it in uh, the bilingual uh, German publication. And this is how most of this poetry emerged for the first time. So Gore's poetry, in the same very well as poetries of his friends, friends of Harms, was just found. Uh, it didn't produce any influence, obviously, uh, at uh, the time when it was written. So it's a very curious question for literary history, how to, um, even how to historicize it, where does it belong, um, if it was hidden for so long. And another uh, interesting problem is what sets of questions uh, should we direct this poetry. Um, I, I think, especially given the audience where I am talking today, uh, the next move would be to understand to what extent this kind of poetry has something in common with a um, certain part of the literary uh, work that arrived, that came out of the Holocaust. Um, and we know that these languages exist, these languages to write about the trauma, the surreal way to respond to the historical pain is one of the strongest and maybe one of the most difficult to analyze. Um, but this is what I try to give you today is kind of, uh, as I uh, told my students recently, it reminds us of, you know, a map of Siberia in the 18th century. Uh, lots of white spots. Thank you. <laughs>